Madeline Beth McCann disappeared on the evening of May 3, 2007 from her bedroom bed in a holiday apartment in Playa da Luz, a resort in Algarve, region of Portugal. Madeline was on holiday from the UK with her parents, Kate and Jerry McCann, her, and her younger twin siblings, and a group of family and friends and their children. She and the twins had been left asleep at around 8.30 in a ground floor apartment while the McCanns and friends dined in a restaurant 160 feet away. The parents checked on the children throughout the evening until Madeline's mother discovered she was missing when she went to go check on the children around 10 o'clock. At first, the Portuguese police seemed to accept that it was an abduction, but after misinterpreting a British DNA analysis, they came to believe that Madeline had died in the apartment. Okay, we know that the McCann family was at the bar, but left the patio door unlocked surprisingly, but was also suspicious is that Jerry claimed to have saw Madeline in bed around 9.05 when he checked. But Kate said she wasn't there when she checked later on. But then a witness by the name of Jean Tanner said she saw Jerry talking with some guy around 9.05 and then later around 9.10 she seen a man carrying a child fitting the description of Madeline. But both Wilkins and Jerry, that Wilkins is the guy that um, Jerry was speaking to, said to not have seen her. Take a look at this video. Yeah, I just got up and walked out of the tapas bar past Jerry talking to Jez. That's when I saw somebody walk across the top of the road carrying a child. And I think I did think, oh, well, there's obviously somebody taking their child home to bed. But it, it didn't look like a standard tourist. Okay, now let's backtrack. You see, around 9.30, Kate was going to go and check on the kids, but Matthew Oldfield, their friend, was already going to check on his kids, so he offered to go instead. He said he saw the kids' bedroom door wide open. He then closed it and didn't bother to go into the room. Kate then went shortly after, around 10 p.m., and she went through the patio door as well, which is near the Tampa's bar in the back entry, and noticed upon coming in that the kids' bedroom door was wide open, and when she tried closing it, it had slammed. That's when she went in and saw that Madeline was gone. She later remembered that morning whereas Madeline asked her mother over breakfast why didn't she come when her brother and her cried last night. Her mother also noticed a brown stain in her daughter's pajama top. Take a look at this video. I think uh, it was uh, one man who took her. I think the man who took her, he was uh, spying on the family in several days. He wanted to take a girl and uh, bring her uh, north of Portugal to deliver her to some other people. Uh, I think this is uh, some big business and they are taking children, kidnapping children for selling and yeah. One thing that is very important, that all the things that I say as a psychic detective, is that nothing of my words can be definitive. Uh, it's not evidence. This is just my feelings and my own sights. So, <clears throat> I believe Madeline was taken. Uh, I think maybe the abductor was in the room at the same time Madeline's father was uh, uh, inside the bedroom and just checking that everything was okay. At this time, I think the kidnapper was hiding and he was very nervous. Uh, I think also he was ready to attack the father and run. But the father, the Madeleine McCain, didn't see him. So when the Madeleine's father went out, he was quick to take Madeleine McCain when the abductor took uh, Madeleine, I think he uh, carried her outside to a car, and not a big car, uh, and they drove north in Portugal. Uh, all the way up, and uh, here there stood some people waiting for him to take over this girl. Because I think this is maybe some trafficking, that uh, this is big business, then almost as a mafia. They buy and sell children, uh, drugs, weapons, uh, I think it's something big. 
And I think this is not just in Portugal, I think this is uh, in several countries. But I think when this man was going to deliver a Madeleine, uh, the other people, the older men told him, this is too dangerous. Someone has spotted you. We can take her. You have to get rid of her. That is my thought uh, about this case. So, um, it is hard to say what really happened, but I think uh, if you are going to find something, I would look uh, almost in the middle of Portugal. For several years ago, I started to look at the uh, Madeleine McCain case and uh, I got a lot of images in my head. And, uh, I started to draw a lake. Uh, it was a very special lake. And I started to draw uh, car roads, and big roads and small roads. And, and uh, I could also say where in the country this lake was even though I had never been in Portugal before and I had never looked at the map. Uh, so we started to Google and we started to look at the map and hopefully find this lake I was drawing. And we found it. It does exist. And the roads I also draw beside the lake is correct. So. I think this is a place uh, we should look more. So if you're going to look for something hidden in Portugal, in nature, I think you need some um, very good dogs to help you out. But this lake, I think this is very important. Uh, it must be a reason why I have seen just exactly this lake. It is not a circled lake, uh, the lake looks like a hand with fingers, so it is special. Perhaps one day I can go back to Portugal and search more for Madeleine McCain to find out what actually happened. So that is a dream for me to do, to help out and um, give the mother and father answers, just to help out. So, I can't give any guarantees since I'm just a psychic. Now this brings me to another witness sighting of a man carrying a child that night that was reported by Martin and Mary Smith, who was on holiday from Ireland. The Smith sighting also offered the approximate time of Madeline's kidnapping. The Smith said that they saw a man at around 10 o'clock on the Rue de la Escola Permedia, about 500 yards from the McCann's apartment walking toward Rura 25 de Abril in the beach. He was carrying a girl aged three to four years old. She had blonde hair and pale skin and was wearing a light colored pajamas and had bare feet. The man was in his mid 30s, they said, um, between the heights of 5'7 and 5'9. Slim to normal build with short brown hair and wearing a cream or beige colored trousers. The same description of what Jan Tanner had said. Okay, here's my first theory. Okay, the psychic had said that the kidnapper was in the house prior to Jerry coming home to check in on the kids and then he hid. So that means that the predator was probably watching the pecans for a while and then knew that they always left the patio door unlocked. So, I believe that he just arrived in that house right after Jerry and Kate leaving to go to Tampa's bar. Meaning that he had about 30 minutes to get in there, probably after the rest of Kate and Jerry's crew left to join him because Jerry left shortly after they arrived at Tampa's bar with him. There was also DNA spotted in the sitting room and along the wall of the kids' room near the window and in the parents' room closet, so I believe the predator hid when he heard Jerry, probably somewhere near the kids' room or maybe even in the kids' room. He then grabbed her after Jerry left and tried leaving out in multiple places, like for example, the sitting room. I believe he did this by placing her on the floor behind the couch while trying to get out of the window, but figured it would be too risky. Cleaning any mess, of course. He then tried the kids' room window, 
but then figured that was too risky as well. So he then just walked out the patio door and down the alley in the opposite direction where Jerry was and where Tanner, that girl, supposedly has saw him. Now, I also believe the DNA came off the curtains because Madeline was probably bleeding or crying because he may have hit her and or covered her mouth and DNA got on the curtains from his hands and then rubbed off on the wall. But remembering to clean any blood that was dropped on the floor anywhere else. Okay, so you know that the cadaver dogs, they sense his blood, body fluid, and or fragments from a corpse, such as uh, hair fragments or bone density or whatever it is they supposed to sense. Anywho, now the question of whether she was dead already prior to the abductor leaving, I believe that she wasn't. But I do believe uh, before he escaped, he quickly went into the parents' room closet to cover her up with, and he had some of her body fluid on his hands, but then there's the DNA that was left in the car. Okay, the dog spotted some DNA in the McCann's car trunk. Then, with careful research, I found out that Jerry McCann and his friend David Payne was caught talking about Madeline McCain in a sexual way a few years before the missing. It was also foretold that David Payne was vacation with them at the time of the missing. Take a look at this clip. Gaspar and her husband, Dr. Savio Gaspar. They had previously been on holiday with the McCanns. As soon as the news of Madeline's apparent abduction became headline news on Friday the 4th of May, the Gaspers were concerned. Their thoughts turned to two unseemly incidents that had occurred whilst they were quaffing wine at their holiday villa alongside the McCanns and Dr. David Payne and his wife. Let's go straight to their witness evidence and see what they told Leicestershire Police on the 16th of May 2007, just 13 days after Madeleine McCann had been reported missing. My husband Savio and I are general practitioners. My husband knows Kate as they both attended Dundee University between 1987 and 1992. We got to be close friends of Jerry and Kate. In 2002 or 2003, Savio and I spent a weekend with Jerry and Kate in Devon. In September 2005, me and our first child, aged 18 months, holidayed in Mallorca with Kate, Jerry, Madeline and their twins, Sean and Emily, who were only a few months old. There were also other friends of Kate and Jerry there, including Dr. David Payne and his wife. They had a daughter around one year old, Dr. Payne organised the trip. Probably around the fourth or fifth day there was an incident that stuck in my mind. I have thought about this incident many times since then. One night when all the adults were sitting around on a patio outside the house where we were all staying, we had been eating and drinking berbers. I sat between Jerry McCann and David and I think both were talking about Madeline. I remember Dave saying to Jerry something about she, meaning Madeline, would do this. While he mentioned the word this, Dave was doing the action of sucking one of his fingers, pushing it in and out of his mouth, while with his other hand he was doing a circle around his nipple with a circular movement around his clothes. This was done in a provocative way. There seemed to be an explicit insinuation about what he was saying and doing. I remember being shocked by that. I always felt it was something very weird and that it was not something anyone would say or do. I looked at Jerry and also at Dave to gauge their reactions. I looked around as if saying, did someone else hear that or was it just me? The conversation stopped for a moment, then we all began conversing again. Moreover, I remember Dave doing the same thing on another occasion, again it was during a conversation in which he was talking about an imaginary scenario, although I'm not sure. He again stuck one of his fingers in and out of his mouth and with the other hand he once again drew a circle around his nipple in a provocative and sexual way. I think he was referring to the way she, his daughter Lily, would behave or what she would do. I remember thinking whether he would look at my daughter and other little girls in a different way than I or others do. I imagined that he had perhaps visited internet sites related to little children. In a word, I thought that he could be interested in child pornography on the web. During our holiday in Mallorca, each parent would bathe the children in turn. I was keen to stay near the bathroom if Dave was bathing the children, and told Savio to be careful and to be close by if Dave was helping to bathe the children, and my daughter in particular. During our stay in Mallorca, 
Dave and his wife Fiona and their daughter Lily used to take Madeline with them for the day in order that Kate and Jerry could rest a bit and have time just for the twins. The first time I heard the terrible news regarding Madeline on the radio, my thoughts raced immediately to Dave. I asked Savio if Dave was also on holiday with the McCanns in Portugal. He didn't know. I watched TV to catch the coverage and eventually discovered that Dave was there with the McCanns. As soon as she realised that Dr Payne had been in Portugal with the McCanns, she and her husband contacted Leicestershire Police. On the 16th of May, they gave this important statement to Detective Constable Brew. So the question is, was Jerry in on it? And that's why DNA was found in her trunk in July of 2007. Did David Payne and Jerry rape and then kill her and then set up later for David Payne to finally sneak her out while they were at Tapas Bar? Could the brunch have been a setup and David and Jerry needed to get Kate and Madeline out of the house? Now, I don't know how Kate didn't suspect anything or is she in on it or not. The question of whether or not Kate knew any of this has always troubled me. Because Jerry and her story kept changing all the time. It was like they were hiding something. They wanted people to keep thinking that she was abducted. So, was David trying to lead people away from their property because his daughter may have been stuffed in their car trunk? Door, Mrs. Pamela Fenn, who died in 2011. She told the police, though only three months later as we shall see, that she heard a child, presumably Madeline, crying from 10.30pm to 11.45pm on the evening of Tuesday the 1st of May. She says that she then heard a door closing at 11.45pm, and then the crying stopped. On the face of it, there is no reason to suspect that this was anything other than the unvarnished truth. Why would an 82-year-old widow lie about anything? Especially something so serious. But, as with almost everything in this case, nothing is quite what it seems. So let's now probe her statement in detail. I will read out the relevant parts of her statement. Mrs. Pamela Fenn, 20th of August, 2007. She has lived in the apartment since 2003. She also refers to the day of the 1st of May, 2007, when she was home alone. At approximately 22.30, she heard a child cry, and that, due to the tone, the crying seemed to be a young child, and not a baby of two years of age or younger. That night, she contacted a friend called Edna Glynn, who also lives in Pride of Luz, after 2300 hours, telling her about the situation, who was not surprised at the child's crying. On the 3rd of May she received a visit from her niece Carol during the morning, who said that when she was on her terrace she saw a male individual looking into the McCann's apartment. She claims, however, that a week previously she was the victim of an attempted robbery, which was not successful, and neither was anything taken, thinking that the crying of the child could be linked to another attempted robbery in the residence. So there are three elements to her story. One, she says she heard a child crying for 75 minutes continuously on Tuesday the 1st of May, two days before Madeline went missing. Two, she says she was burgled in the week before Madeline went missing. And three, she says on the day Madeline went missing, her niece, Carol Tranmer, visited her and happened to see a man peering suspiciously into the McCann's apartment. But first, let's notice when she makes her statement. She does so on the 20th of August 2007. That's over three and a half months, or 111 days, since the date she says she heard the crying on Tuesday the 1st of May. So exactly how did Mrs. Fenn's statement, with its dramatic news of a burglar, a suspicious man, and a child's crying for 75 minutes come about? By looking at the lead-up to it, this will help us to form a view on whether Mrs. Fenn was telling the truth or not. Newspaper coverage about Mrs. Fenn in several British newspapers suddenly broke on Saturday the 18th of August 2007. It's strange that the story broke two days before she gave her statement to the police. This is what The Sun told us. Their story was headed, Your Sis, Maddie is Missing and featured the McCann's claim that only now, three months after Madeline went missing, had the McCann's told their twins, Amelie and Sean, that Madeline had been abducted. But the story also made these revelations about Mrs. Pamela Fenn. The Portuguese cops are again under fire. The woman living in the apartment above the McCann's claimed she had not been spoken to by police until the British team arrived two weeks ago.
Expat Pam Le Fen told them she disturbed a burglar at her apartment about three weeks before Maddie vanished. She is now to give a formal statement to Portuguese officers. A friend said she was surprised that neither the police nor the McCanns had approached her before. Pamela also said that her niece, who stayed with her the week Maddie disappeared, spotted somebody fitting the description of a man seen carrying a child away under a blanket. The pal added he was acting suspiciously. I have no doubt that the so-called friend mentioned in this story is none other than the McCann's official PR spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, whose job at the time Madeline was reported missing was the head of Tony Blair's propaganda machine, the Media Monitoring Unit, at the Central Office of Information. In this story, the burglary is said to have taken place three weeks before Madeline went missing, not one week, as she says in her official statement. The article quotes the friend as saying that Mrs. Fenn was surprised that the police had not approached her before. Surely the much greater surprise is that Mrs. Fenn had done nothing for three and a half months to report an attempted burglary, a suspicious man hanging round the McCann's apartment, and hearing a child sobbing her heart out in the apartment below her for 75 minutes, two days before she was reported missing. So with all of this being said, did Kate know something? I think she didn't and her husband has convinced her of this to hide what he did. Could Jerry have told David that they were going out and how and when to get her? Could it have been that poor Madeline was a victim of a sick sexual fixation made by her father Jerry and David Payne? Now, the DNA in the parents' closet was from the abductor trying to find something to cover up with, as I stated earlier. And also, as I stated earlier, he tried several locations to leave. He tried the kids' room window and then sitting room window, but of course, remembering to clean up after himself. He then left out the patio door. I also believe he then placed her in Jerry's car trunk to later taking her out. My last theory is it was a death by false medication or by resulting in an ultimate and irreversible death. And a reversible death by which destroyed lungs for a trained doctor is very easy. No professional help is needed anymore. Now, an emergency call thus would have been of no practical use. The parents, however, would have been blamed for that accident. Depending on the very details, it possible could have resulted in losing their licenses to work as doctors. This would have been a strong motive to not call for immediate help. It also provides a very strong motive to cover up the incident as an abduction by an unknown stranger. Losing their licenses would have resulted in losing their new house, which at the time was about $400,000. Losing proper education for the twins while practically falling from middle class into depth and poverty. So with all of this being said, okay, was this done on purpose or was it just an accident? Was Jerry raping his daughter and he needed to cover it up quick of risk losing his wife and freedom? Was Jerry also very controlling and sometimes violent toward his wife as speech and behavior analysis have said? Or were they both in on this and they both covered it up? Meaning that Kate knew Jerry was sexually abusing their child and now some cases and studies have shown that a mother of a child that has been sexually abused will sometimes grow a resentment toward the child out of jealousy. And although she does love the child, but Madeline was taking attention away from her. You see, we have to think about the fact that she just had twins and she could have been suffering from postpartum depression. Take a look at this. Madeline is beyond concern. Madeline is beyond help. There's no more fretting or worrying for Madeline. And that's what's in the statement. Mm -hmm. Is Madeline crying? Does she have her favorite teddy bear? Is she getting her meds? Is she calling out for me, the mother? Is Madeline in excruciating pain? What must Madeline be experiencing in the hands of strangers? These are all things that were not in their language. Yeah. And this is consistent. This is not just one interview. These people have always been focused upon themselves. They have always given an indication that Madeline will not be found alive, if found at all, and that Madeline being found is not something they want to happen. Mm -hmm. Their concern is always for themselves because Madeline doesn't need concern any longer. The past tense reference is one thing that indicates death, but this is the most powerful part 
of the analysis is that they're telling us Madeline is dead. Now, I know that, that people wondered if there was a kidnapping, if they were sold into um, sex rings, child sex rings, and these things do exist. That's not what's in the parents' language. So I, I can only say what's in that language. And I'm letting them guide me. I'm letting them dictate to me my opinion by the words that they're choosing. Mm -hmm. And they're actually going to give us more detail. Mm -hmm. Richard, they're going to confess. You think so? Oh, oh you, you mean in the subtext of the, of, the, of the interview? You don't mean literally, do you? They're, in, their, in this statement, we're going to see what we call a statement analysis confession. Right. They actually admit to us what happened. Did you kill your daughter? No. That's an emphatic no. I mean, the ludicrous thing is um, what, I suppose, what's been purported from Portugal is that Madeline died in the apartment by an accident and we hid her body. Well, when did she have the accident and died? Because the only time she was left unattended was when we were at dinner. So if she died then, how could we have disposed or hidden her body, you know, when there was an immediate search. It's just nonsense. So, and if she died when we were in the apartment or fell and did, why would we, why would we cover that up? And this is what we call the embedded confession. This is where a guilty party will put together in their own language what happened. And we need to listen and believe them. We also have the principle of them asking questions. This is very important. They're asking questions to find out how their answers will be responded to. Will it be ridicule? Would it be acceptance? Will it sound sane? Would it help get them off the hook? Listen very carefully to what they say. It's a yes or no question. Did you kill your daughter? No is a good answer. And what, what I teach investigators to do is when someone is asked a yes or no question is to count on their fingers the number of words following the word no. No. That's an emphatic no. And, on, and obviously it goes into the point where it goes beyond your ten fingers. When it goes that long, very simply speaking, there is a need to persuade. So the no is not going to stand on itself. If he said no, I didn't kill my daughter and I'm telling you the truth, this would be something very strong. And we'd have to ask about her. And we'd also have to ask, did something cause your daughter's death, that sort of thing. But here, no, that's an emphatic no. The first thing we know about his denial is that his denial, from his perspective, needs some help. It's weak. That's an emphatic no. So the first thing is no, okay, an emphatic no. My no needs emphasis. Why does it need to be emphasis? Is one. I mean, the ludicrous thing is um, what I suppose what's been purported from Portugal is that Madeline died in the apartment by accident and we hid her body. Okay. What he tells us here is Madeline died in the apartment, his words, by an accident, which would support the pronoun we that we heard between mother and child, and we hid her body. I believe him. The reason I say this is an embedded confession is because he is not entering any other language. He's not quoting anyone. For instance, if I said, well, you said that I killed her. That's not an embedded confession, because I'm actually quoting you. Here, he's not, not only is he not quoting anyone, he's only saying what's been purported, not even an accusation. And we need to be listening to him. This now tells me, as an analyst, Madeline died in the apartment. So I know from their language thus far that Madeline is not alive. They are in need of an alibi. The death was not intended. And the location of the death is in the apartment. And again, by accident. And then I know something else now. I know that we hid the body. Jerry and his wife, um, sorry, the, the two mechanics together, they work together to hide her body. Then he goes into questions, and this is where um, guilty parties are looking to see what a response is. They want, they're, they, they're disguised as rhetorical questions, but they want to see what people respond to them as. This takes place even in the interview process. Well, when did she have the accident and died? Okay, what they want to know is, do people know the exact time of death? Because 
The only time she was left unattended, she was left unattended is not the only time we left her. He's now removing himself from that. Left unattended is passive. Was when we, which shows unity between him, uh, him and his wife, were at dinner. So if she died then, which this is, a, we call this an allowance. The father of a missing child is allowing for a scenario that denial will not allow. There's no natural denial. He's saying if she died, then, not even, not even if she was dead, which is itself a red flag, but now about a specific time, how could we have disposed, uh, hidden her body? The word disposed and then hidden, the change there, actually shows respect for Madeline. It's a softer terminology. Not dump the body, and, not, and he even changes dispose, a self-correction from dispose to hidden. He now tells us that they didn't dispose the body, they actually hid it. This is why, and this confirms um, the priority. We want there to be light, we want there to be searching. By the way, we also want them to find Madeline. But it's last on my, mm -hmm. my list of priorities. So I now know that Madeline is dead. Madeline died in the apartment. And listen to his questions. When did we do this? How did we do this? You know, when there's an immediate, it's just nonsense, self-censoring again. And if she died when we were in the apartment or fell and died, why would, we, why would we cover that up? Okay, That's the most important question he asks. So he now introduces something else that may have happened. Madeline fell. I am concerned and remain concerned that Madeline may have been drugged in any way, shape, or form, whether it be nighttime cough syrup or something more, so that these people could go and have their dinner and their party and get their break and all that that Madeline awoke and fell and got injured, and the injury was beyond. Yeah. Can I just interject with a question, Peter? Sure. When, when he's saying, um, he's, he, he's alluding to the fact that he doesn't think they would have had time on that particular evening to deal with the body. Could that suggest that there's been pre-planning and the meal was orchestrated to allow for a window for their phantom abductor. And he needs confident that he can show the audience that there's not enough time for them to have done that. So in other words, it's possibly happened on a previous time. Yes, it, would, it wouldn't, it is possible. And, uh, and this, the focus on time, which he doubles up on, opens that door up now for us. Right. We have to consider it. Um, intention, it hasn't changed. In other words, that this death was not intended is not changed by this. But the fact that they do, or he does, in his language, focus so much on time, we must now be open to the possibility that he has a confidence about this time frame because it happened at a different time frame. So the answer is yes. Okay. What he's doing is he's affirming every other point of analysis. So when I said earlier that we look at little point here, little point there, he's now summed it up for us. The reason why this father does not show any concern about what Madeline is going through is because Madeline is beyond experiencing anything that he would need to be, be concerned about. Mm -hmm. They hid her body. Right. That's what they did, according to his language. But I, I don't think we should dismiss quickly that he introduced falling. She was very tired, Kate said. Mm -hmm. um, they had left her for their own. And so he asked the question, why would we cover this up? Mm -hmm. And the answer is quite simple. We have professional people who have two other children, an unintentional, unintentional death. You're going to lose custody of the children. Mm -hmm. uh, another motive. Any possibility of their, their involvement. That's what their priority is. But we went through this interview, and not once did I hear a single word of human empathy expressed for Madeline. Mm -hmm. Not once. Madeline is the victim. 
And if, if the deception was to be believed, someone had Madeline. And was she wearing a warm coat on a, on a cool night? Anything, even the slightest bit of concern, none of that is in their radar because it's not in their hearts. It's not in their minds. It's not in their minds because they know that Madeline is beyond all help. What I concluded from just this interview itself is that Madeline is dead. The death was not intentional. That they have disposed of her remains in a hidden manner of which they feel confident will not be found. The cause of death was likely not intended and may have included both causing her to be very sleepy and a fall. They have feared being accused, their concerns about themselves, and that the time frame that they've given must be questioned. Those are, are things that I conclude strongly. Now, underneath that is um, the possibility of sexual abuse being part of this equation is strong. And strong. it would have to be explored, yes. Right. Okay. It would have to be explored. My final analysis, I do believe that Madeline was drugged and she was being abused and the screaming that was heard from the upstairs neighbor was when she was probably being raped or beaten by her dad, probably on the bed by the window or her bed, doesn't really matter. And she was running probably toward the patio door and he then closed it. She didn't try running out the window behind the couch, but then she fell and she died. And then Jerry told troubled and passive acting Kate what had happened and she was upset, yes, but also relieved for two reasons. She's no longer second and Maddie isn't being harmed anymore. And Jerry, he didn't care because that means he's in the clear. So I do believe they both agreed to hide her body for now. Then later they staged the kidnapping. Now this is just a theory. Please leave your theories and comments below. I'm dying to hear them. Oh, and also, if you know anything about this case, please call the number listed. And if you are new to the channel, please subscribe because I will be posting a missing child video now every Tuesday and other videos now every Friday. That's unless there's some urgent news that needs to be analyzed. So other than that, with all of this being said, stay safe, keep your kids safe, and take care.